Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Reflect and Revive. My name is Naomi Bussinger. I'm very excited to be coming to you today because today is day one of a series that I have been working on called Seven Secrets to Spiritual Success. And there's a quote I wanted to start off with that I think is great that I'll probably refer back to several times. The author is unknown, but it kind of defines what it is to be a spiritual man or a spiritual woman. A spiritual man is not a mystical, angelic, otherworldly person with a halo about his head and a faraway look in his eyes. A spiritual man is a person who is good when he doesn't feel like being good, who is patient when he feels like being impatient, who smiles and keeps sweet and does not retaliate when he is lied about who is cheerful when he feels like being downcast, who goes to church when he'd rather sleep at home or go on a joy ride, who keeps steadily and sweetly at the job of being a Christian when he really feels like just going out and slamming the door. I think that's profound. Like I said, we'll probably come back to it a couple of times. I know that there are several instances in that quote where I'm like, ooh, that's been me a few times. Uh, but so, how do you get spiritual success? Like, how do you grow in your spiritual life? How do you become more Christ-like? I think lesson one has to come down to accepting personal responsibility for your actions, for your spiritual life. You know, all, all of the things, the things that you choose to do, the things that you choose to say, your demeanor, everything about you. Taking personal responsibility and that's a really tough thing to do today because you're going against the grain of our culture today it seems to be a world of irresponsibility playing the blame game you know there's always a reason why it really wasn't all your fault um, and if you take the, the fall of man the story of Adam and Eve I think that today there are many people that would say Oh, it was all Eve's fault. Adam was punished. He was cursed. He was kicked out of the garden all because of Eve's actions. And that's not fair. But that's not, like, that couldn't be further from the truth. Adam was not punished because of what Eve did. Adam was punished because he yielded to Eve and her desire. He chose to walk the path of sin with her. Therefore, he was cursed, punished, removed from the garden. It wasn't Eve's fault. They both chose individually to sin. So I wanted to get into a story today. Um, and it's really about, it, it shows how it's not just uh, actions that are sin, but our behavior, how, how we act, our level of emotional intelligence, and how we must choose do not let the behavior of others influence our behavior. So in some spare time today or this week, I highly recommend you go through and read 1 Samuel chapter 25. This is a story of Nabal and Abigail, their husband and wife, and the future King David. Now it was common practice in these days for rich landowners to pay men who came through their land and protected their flocks, their herds, their shepherds, their supplies. Very common practice to that day's culture. And this is what David and his men had just completed. They had protected Nabal's um, shepherds, flocks, and supplies. And they did a, a very good job. The scripture states that not one thing missing. So they didn't lose one supply. They didn't lose like one sheep. No man was injured, like nothing. It was flawless. So when that time frame had come to an end, David sent a few of his younger men to go speak to Nabal and ask him for provisions. Again, very common. Asked him for food for his men. Asked him if they could come on, on a day in which they would serve food. And we have, before I go into Nabal's response, let's, let's talk about him for a moment. His, um name means fool and there is such a difference in personality and demeanor in, his, in him and his wife that the scripture kind of goes out of its way to say that 
If you read verse three, verse three says, the woman was intelligent and beautiful, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings. So his response to David's um, men was basically a mockery. Um, he's like, you know, I don't know who David is. How do I know? I'm going to send all of my hard work earnings off to some man I don't even know. And my slaves are running around with, with stuff and leaving and stealing stuff every day. And it wasn't just a rejection uh, of David's plea. Um, it wasn't that. It wasn't just not paying him for the work that he did. It was sarcastic mockery because during that day, word would have already spread to Nabal that David had been anointed uh, to be the future king. So the probability that he really did know who David was, was really high. Um, and that just kind of fits right into his demeanor as the Bible describes it. So David's men go back and tell him what happened. And David's like, okay, game on. Um, you're not gonna pay me for my services. I am going to war with you. So David and 300 of his men suit up for battle, who's about 200 men behind the supplies, and they go. And in the scripture, it says, and I'm paraphrasing, um, may God be angry at me if I leave any of his men alive by morning. And so Nabal's men go and run to Abigail. And I'm thinking in my mind, it's a last ditch effort. Like maybe she knows what to do. We're all gonna die. David surely is gonna come and slaughter us. So we know his reputation precedes him. And Abigail's like, okay, get all these supplies. And she lists them out and take them to David. I'm gonna also go to David. She gets on a donkey and rides to David. And as soon as she sees him, she gets off and she gets on her knees and, and like lays down in front of him. And she, does not let her husband's demeanor, personality, uh, evilness influence what she's gonna do. She takes all of the blame on herself. She apologizes. She's like, I, I know who you are. I am so sorry. Please, you know, please spare these men for my husband's foolish actions. Here are all the supplies and she just over and over again, she's apologizing. And David ends up thanking her for preventing him from participating in bloodshed on that day. He takes the supplies and leaves. What a story. What a story. It could have been very easy for Abigail to be influenced by her husband's actions, his words, his demeanor. But she took responsibility for her own actions and the actions of others. She took their responsibility when they chose not to. That's a great lesson of uh, spiritual success. That took a very strong woman, especially in that day and age. Um, you know, men were definitely the head of the household then. Definitely had uh, the say in everything that was done. Oh, what a brave woman. What a brave woman. So go through and read that when you can. That's 1 Samuel chapter 25. And I just had a couple of takeaways for you um, as far as your responsibility for your spiritual success. Number one, your treatment of others is unrelated to their treatment of you. Your treatment of others is unrelated to their treatment of you. And we find an example of this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. And I'm going to read it to you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So it's basically saying, like, you have to be set apart. 
you have to be set apart. If your treatment of others is unrelated to their treatment of you, then you're different from the world. Because the world it only loves people who love them. The world is only friends with people who loves them. But the Christian is called to love everybody. The Christian is called to love people who talk about you, people who lie about you, people who gossip about you. You're called to love them. So you must take responsibility for that spiritual choice. Uh, the second scripture is uh, John chapter 14, 15 through 17, which is really talking about, to me, uh, obedience is key. Uh, you, you've been given the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will guide you. So you have to take responsibility in that. If you love me, you will keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and he will be in you. You are responsible to do what is right no matter what anyone else does. Another person's wrong is never an excuse for your wrong. No one can make you do anything. All actions that are conscious involve choices and decisions. I pray today that you will be ever mindful of the Holy Spirit in your life and seek his guidance for everything that you choose to do and everything that you choose to say. See you guys tomorrow. Bye.